Hello, and welcome to my series, Startup Grudge, where we discuss topics related to the world of startups, entrepreneurs, and investing. I'm your host, Jonathan Hung, and today's episode, I'm joined by Iman Kubian. Iman, thank you for coming on. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Excited to, uh, to be here. Yeah, same. I'd love to give uh, all our viewers and listeners uh, you know, a little background about yourself. So you're the manager and general partner of Crescent Capital, and you actually source and evaluate all investment opportunities. Uh, whether it comes to real estate, private equity, and tech, uh, you're a licensed California real estate broker, and you've pre- previously worked at you know Google as a finance operations manager. And we actually went to USC probably around the same time as an undergrad in '05. So great to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the show, uh, being part of the show. So I love to get started. Like, how did you get into investing? You know, whether it's from real estate first and then into venture. I'd love to hear your journey. Yeah. So. Started full time about um, six years ago. I had left Google. Mm -hmm. Um, I took some time off. I wanted to figure out what I wanted to do next. I knew at that time, after being at Google and Deloitte and got a business school, um, I was trying to look for something a little bit to do on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, I took some time off um, and I was trying to see if I go back into more of like a startup style role or not. Mm -hmm. Um, But ended up taking over our uh, family office. Uh, My dad retired and it was pretty much kind of handed to me. Um, Our family office at the time was all into real estate, all in SoCal. Um, After a few months of kind of getting structured, getting my feet wet and kind of understanding the business, I wanted to kind of make it into my own, both from the real estate side and on, you know, the venture side and other um, investments. Um, so I looked at how do I get into tech investing? I was always interested in that coming from Google, Mm -hmm. from living in the Bay, coming back to LA. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, started about six years ago doing it full time since then done, you know, over 50 real estate investments, over a hundred venture investments, um, four or five private equity investments. Um, Mm -hmm. on the venture side, it's been a mix of, um, like investing through, syndicates and crowdsource, um, Mm -hmm. direct investing, uh, funds. Um, and yeah, I've really, really enjoyed it. Been able to kind of take our, you know, family office and whatnot and, and diversify both amongst real estate assets and now other assets and really have enjoyed this, this past five years and, uh, you know, look excited for what the future kind of brings now too. No, no, that's great. We kind of almost have similar background stories, but I was just doing uh, my family's contract manufacturing business. So, no, I totally get it. I get it. It's like, you know, it's it's really like I think about like, oh, yeah, that was my dad's baby. And, you know, make sure we never landed the plane correctly. And but now it's like you got your own future and you want to, you know, plant your own flag. Totally get it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, my for the most part, my dad and, you know, my grandfather before didn't get me and my brother involved at all. So that's why I kind of had more of a corporate type of history. So whether it was out of college or going to business school and Deloitte and and, and Google, um, which actually really helped, you know, Mm -hmm. I I can still use that, um, you know, the the knowledge that I gained that that experience and now and like you said, now kind of build this build this on my own. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Um, I love to hear, like, how do you find deals? You know, like, how do you source your, you know, venture capital deals versus your real estate deals? Yeah. So on the venture side, so when I started out about five, six years ago, being in LA, um, my main source was through like the crowdfunding websites. So mm-hmm. AngelList being a, a big one. Um, and at that time, AngelList isn't what it is now. It was still mm-hmm. earlier on. The There was fewer number of deals, probably better quality too, as a, as a whole. Right. Um, and I could ask those questions back to those syndicate leads because there weren't as many LPs either and get mm-hmm. some sort of dialogue back and forth. Um, so I started out with that. And the benefit of that um, is you can also write smaller checks. So as right. I was kind of proving myself, mm-hmm. I can write checks for a thousand, twenty five hundred, five thousand dollars $5,000 and try to really learn. Um, it, was a, it was a way to learn um, how, how it all works. Um, and now since that in the past five or six years done over, you know, a hundred, you know, deals through, through, um, through there. Um, it's slowed down. I've slowed down as it's kind of blown up because the deal yeah. quality is not as good. Right. Um, so the other source is just through my own network. So I'm part of, you know, Tech Coast Angels here in LA. Um, 
And even though um, the, the big part of Tech Coast is the people that are part of that, really smart members, it's, it's 100 people with various backgrounds and I could tap into that at, at any time and whether there's companies pitching Tech Coast or if someone, one of the members has a deal through their own separate network that mm -hmm. they'll bring. Um, and then it's just going to events and putting myself out there. Um, demo days, um, pitch competitions, networking events. Um, once I've kind of tell people I'm an investor, right. um, it, it kind of just, it, it comes naturally. And then through my own network now, I mean, I just got a, a deal sent last week through a buddy of mine from business school. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you get that too, right? It's, yep. it's that, that network of, Hey, I, this guy's really good. You guys should meet him. Um, so a combination of that, of that three, um, <clears throat> is, is really where I, where I do. And so I'll, I'll try to spend, you know, yeah. on the Angelus side, maybe an hour a week now looking through those deals. Um, okay. but really it's, it hasn't, it's not the main source that it once was. Right. Um, and now it's mostly just on my own networking side. Okay. No, wonderful. And I mean, out of curiosity, like, you know, it's a great time to ask this question, like with everything's happening in the economy, you know, we're just uh, a week away from, you know, a week after FTX is collapsed, you know, and all this. So I love to get your input about, you know, what you see now in the real estate market versus the venture market. And like, how do you like judge the both going forward in the next couple of months or, you know, quarters? Yeah. Um, so on the real estate side, depending on the asset class, every asset class is a little bit different on there's obviously been a slowdown. There's been price corrections, you know, throughout in, in talking to apartment owners and apartment, you know, the, the big general partners who are buying apartment deals, mm -hmm. they are now take, they are now stepping back and waiting. Um, yeah. people are holding on to cash. Um, I had a call last week with a large, you know, multifamily operator. They have over a billion in assets. And he's like, we're not going to be buying anything the rest of this year, most likely into Q1 and Q2 next year. We're waiting for that distress to come. Real estate's a little bit slower in the cycle where the distress will show a little bit later on. Right. <clears throat> really, especially as people who had shorter term debt, though that debt comes, comes due and they won't be able to refi and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so there has been a slowdown. Um, there has been price corrections, but there's still deals to be made. If I'm, I committed on a deal, I got one just an hour ago on a deal um, where originally they're asking 70 million and he's about to get an under contract for 50 million. So it shows that deals can still be made at the right price point. On the yeah. venture side where we operate, mm -hmm. you know, on the seed side and pre-seed, there hasn't really been much of a price valuation correction from what I've seen. Obviously, I don't see the crazy $50 million seed rounds, right? Um, the biggest thing that I've seen on the venture side is now that there's time to actually evaluate a deal, that deals aren't subscribing within an hour or within a day, and you have to commit without really taking your time with it. So I think that slowdown is, is really good. Yeah, um, and, and helps helps the you know ecosystem to really do the DD and, and really figure out um, especially for us as angels, we tend to take a little bit, might take a little bit longer. Um, right. Cause we, it might, we don't, I don't really have an expertise in a single category more, you know, diverse. Yep. So I, I would like to have that time. I never like to feel like I'm rushed into making a decision. Um, uh, yeah. that's the biggest thing I've seen. You know, I don't know if, if you've seen that now as well. Yeah. From my perspective, I think now it's like the later stage deals. You're going to know who's going to be winning and losing, basically, because now it's like there's if there's no growth, there's no revenue, you're not going to get more money to figure that out. So I think like maybe valuations or there will be like down rounds for them to survive. But I think, like you said, pre-seed and seed, I think everyone's like at that point where like, OK, we're anything pre-seed should be under 10 million, probably under five, we'll be real. And then for pre-seed investments, you got to be under 20 depending where your traction is. And we'll see, you know, like I went out to a, an event last night, actually with my friend and it was just like, people were pitching and like, you know, you got to get there early now. And like, it's not about just like raising just in time. Like you got to think like at least two, three quarters out uh, when, when you run out of money. <laughs> right. And I think as a, as an investor, it's always good to have your fundamentals, like your metrics that, that you look at. 
On yep. the real estate side, it's more like data driven, right? Mm-hmm. Right, like average rent, press per square, square foot, cap rates, things like that. Where even regardless of what's going on on macro market level during boom and bust, if you stick to your fundamental metrics, you tend to do well, right? And same with venture. Venture's a little not as much data driven, but there are data points and um, kind of gut and feel and, and talking to the founder and seeing what kind of their vision is. Um, and not getting caught up in that kind of FOMO and that, that mm-hmm. urgency and that rush. So if you stick to those fundamentals as an investor overall, in my bit, opinion, we you know tend to do well. So there is FOMO during that boom where, hey, I got to hurry up and get into it. But if you have that kind of self-control to say, okay, hold on, this is not you know mm-hmm. feasible, it's not sustainable, um, you tend to do well overall. Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense to me. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, from the real estate perspective, do you use any certain tools or websites or like, uh, you know, SaaS business models? Like, I know for me, I have a startup called Placer.ai. I don't know if you've heard of it or think about using that software. Um, we don't use, you know, our, my real estate stuff. So we have properties that we own and manage and just mm-hmm. manage it through like um, QuickBooks. Right. We accept Zelle payments. We, we're not large enough on our own to use like sophisticated SaaS tools where we need. Um, and a lot of the newer stuff where I talked about, we invest as LPs in larger deals. So we make sure that the GP has, you know, online rent payments, a rent portal. Um, we've, I've invested in a lot of prop tech stuff um, mm-hmm. as well. So for us, it's QuickBooks, Zelle, Google Sheets, Microsoft, you know, Excel, um, because we're we're more, you know, smaller scale mom and pop, but our partners definitely have, you know, all of that sophisticated uh, uh, SaaS tools. No, yeah. And then when we look at the VC side, like everyone asks me all the time as an angel investor, because I still see myself as an angel, even though I might run a fund or two. I love to get your perspective, like as an angel investor, what are you looking for? Because this is like really a pre-seed investment. That's where angels come in most likely. You know, we're not coming in when it's a billion dollars. You know, we're not writing you know ten million dollar checks necessarily. But you know, that twenty five to hundred k check, like what gives you that confidence to write and invest in a startup founder? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's just the standard stuff. I mean, the founder, obviously, especially at that stage, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, how is he not only the pitch, but how does he answer questions afterwards? Mm. You could see a lot of times the founder can perfect a pitch because he does it so often, but right. how does he respond during the, the, the question and answer session? Um, mm. and I like in a group setting when, you know, a founder can talk to me directly one-on-one, but when there's a room of 20 or 30, how is he interacting with, with each one and how is he answering those questions? And he's got to know his stuff, right? Um, especially at that stage. If someone's asking a number, if he's asking about something that was in the deck, you know, sometimes founders won't know like what that number is. And that, that really looks bad. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's a big, big one at that seed, pre-seed stage. Um, and then it's just what is, what is the product? What's the market? Is it really going to be, is there potential for venture-like returns? Sometimes I've seen a venture investment where I, I don't see that a hundred, a thousand X, that billion dollar plus opportunity. It's still a great business, but it's more like a niche business. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's really, I've come to learn that more as time has gone on. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, all, yeah, just, and then just, you know, the product, try, I like to try the product. If, if it's an app, sometimes while he's pitching, I'm downloading the app, checking out the reviews. Um, and then talking to people in, in, in my network, a lot of times I've done like emerging market deals. Um, then I'll ask people that I know or who have family in, in Mexico or whatnot and say, Hey, what do you think about this? Like, what is your, what does your wife think? What does your brother-in-law think? Can I pick his brain for a little bit? Um, and then, yeah, ultimately just, just making that decision. If I feel, you know, it's a strong founder, a great product or a great service, um, Potential is there writing, writing that check um, and, and going from there. I, I, you know, one thing that I realized, and sometimes you'll, I'll focus too much on the negatives. What can go wrong? What's that risk? And I feel like I, it's a good deal, but then I psych myself out and then I look back on it and, I, and the, that deal, that company ends up doing really well. 
Right. And that hurts and stings more than the companies that I've wrote and the deals gone to zero. Right? right. The ones that I passed on where I knew, but I overthought and I focused too much on the risks and not on the benefits. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure you've, you've done that too. And it kind of comes with, oh, yeah. with learning is, and those sting more for me is, you know, passing on that deal where I knew I should have put it in. Um, so now if, if I have a feeling, a gut feeling, mm-hmm. um, and there aren't really major red flags, even on those deals that I passed on, it wasn't red, red flags. It was just me overthinking it. Yeah. Um, so I'm now don't focus too much on the negatives and the risks. focus on what can go right. And those chances of it going right. And that potential, if that potential is there, the risks, no matter what the risks are, they'll figure it out and go ahead and, and write that check. No, amazing. Great. And out of curiosity, so when it comes to like real estate deals and VC deals, like how do you measure a, a better successful gain? Because like, you know, obviously in VC, I, my personal rule is like 10x, if I can 10x from here. And then real estate, obviously that's not what we're looking for. It's not 10x. So like, I'm curious how you like mitigate the risk reward profile of each investment from the categories. Yeah. So on, on the real estate side, we're more conservative, even though we do riskier um, development deals. Um, we're looking for just, you know, teens in the IR. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really, what I really love is just long term holds. People who are going to buy good quality generational assets and hold it for the long term. There's huge benefits from a tax perspective on real estate. Um, where you can just refi it out four or five years, every four or five years, pull your capital out and just get, you know, tax free cash flow. Mm-hmm. Um, so if someone is the returns in the first few years are low, but their plan is, Hey, we're going to hold this, you know, long term. That's, that's what I really enjoy. Um, but it's really good assets and in, in, in good markets. Um, and we, I, my focus is being an LP investor is finding GPs or, mm-hmm. um, general partners or real estate companies who syndicate their deals, who have a good track record. So um, I'd rather be a smaller piece in a larger deal mm-hmm. than a big piece in a small deal. Um, so as I've kind of grown out our real estate business, it's finding partners like that. Um, and it's, it's done well on the venture side. Like you said, you know, the 10 X is always nice. I think if I get my money back after three, four years too, I'm okay with that. It's not a loss. Um, but yeah, the, the 10 X is always nice. Um, and I, I think on the venture side, it's, it's a little bit tougher. It's, it's a longer time horizon. So I haven't been there for that full 10 year cycle. I'm kind of halfway through. I've had, you know, a few wins, a few losses, and yeah. I'm sure there's going to be many more losses that are, that are going to come up. Um, I, I like it when they raise a rent, like when we come in as a seed investor or pre-seed investor and yeah. we get validation in a year or 18 months when they raise that round, that up yep. round at a higher valuation, that's, mm-hmm. that's my validation. I know it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to definitely lead to success, but that's where I kind of have, have felt good afterwards where we came in at a 5 million or an 8 million valuation and then they, they raised this, you know, large round afterwards. Yeah, no, Absolutely. And out of curiosity, like, wh- what do you do, um, you know, as an investor in terms of like what you read, publications or podcasts that you might listen to that, you know, gets you really up to date? Because like, you know, we think about like, hey, we're not in school anymore, but we have to continuously be learning. So what would you do to get like better at your craft? Yeah. So I'm always reading, you know, the news. Um, I like reading, you know, browsing Twitter. So I don't mm-hmm. necessarily post on Twitter, but I like other people's Same. opinions. Yeah. and what they're posting about, whether it's real estate operators, VC operators, you know, politics, news, whatever it is, I want to see what that kind of real time um, news is. And it's been a great source. And I've also met a lot of people through there by just reaching out to them, both mm-hmm. on the real estate side and venture side. Um, podcasts, you know, the All In podcast has been great. Really enjoyed it. Those four guys are brilliant guys. I'm super envious of, you know, obviously of their success, but of their thought process, the way they address and talk about how they think through issues is really um, interesting. I've learned a lot through that. Um, <clears throat> there was another podcast through uh, Gimlet. Guy, Guy Raz has some really good podcasts. He had one. 
I don't know if he still films it, but it was a it was a pit show, so similar to Shark Tank, but it was real VCs. It was a little bit more like realistic, and that really helped um, a few years ago. Listening to that to see how these VCs are answering those questions and what they're looking for. Um, he had another one, how to make it, which was actually a really good one too. Um, yeah, those are those, and then just just keeping up to date, going to networking events, talking to smarter people than me. I always want to find, hey, you know, what are you looking? What are you seeing? You know, when I when I went to when I went to my first YC, the YC like demo day, this was like the most overwhelming thing for me. And so I found people that I knew. I'm like, hey, what did you think of this company? What are the companies looking at? What are you looking for? Just playing that, um, just asking those questions really helps. And people, for the most part, no one's you know, everyone tries to be helpful. No one's going to brush you off or lead you the wrong way. So putting myself out there to ask questions, if I'm asking thoughtful questions, I've always had people reach out and, and help. And I try to do the same now as well. Actually, no, that's great. I agree with you. It's, it takes a, a village, right? As they say, and you have to have a really great team, you know, like that was my probably mistake starting off as an angel investor. Like I just do it on myself and no, you just, you have to ask other people uh, what they and like, and maybe you hear one point, it totally changes your entire view on that company. It's absolutely true. Especially um, as a solo, as a solo kind of operator and whatever GP that I am, like we talked about earlier, if, if I kind of start overthinking it too much in my head, having someone else to bounce that idea off of or getting someone else's viewpoint really helps. So now I'll, I'll reach out and look, hey, what do you guys think about this? What do you think about that? This is what I'm seeing. Um, it, it really helps as a, as a solo, um, kind of solo operator or whatnot. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, like love to finish up with this one question. Like, you know, we're in this crazy world of like web three NFTs, crypto. I'm just curious, like, have you gotten like caught up in any of that or like any thoughts on where in that market or that industry is heading? Um, so I did get caught up just to play with on a smaller amount. Um, you know, bought some, set money on fire pretty much, <laughs> right? Bought some random NFTs, bought some random coins. Um, you know, it was, I did not get caught up in the hype as much where I know people who put seven figures, eight figures into it, yeah. who took out loans against real estate to invest oh, yeah. into it, did wow. not get it caught up in that. Mine was... You know, I didn't even have six figures in it. It was low five figures, a size of venture investment, just to kind of dabble in and play. Um, I think the I saw the hype when people were raising round, were raising funds, mm -hmm. whether it was crypto funds or NFT funds, off of pseudonyms. They weren't even saying who they were. It yeah, was you just off of their avatar. <laughs> yep. And because my 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 thesis has always been find people who have expertise in, in, in markets, whether it's real estate, whether it's ventures, and invest with them. I'm not going to be able to trade NFTs and crypto. And once I kind of got into it, I'm like, I don't know about this. So it turned out to be right. Um, there was some investments we did on more like DeFi and, and blockchain. And there was a fund that I invested in that kind of focused on that. And that had done well. And they had coins that they cashed out on on the, on the peak in that fund, um, which did well. But where I see it going... Obviously, now a lot of it turns out to be scams and Ponzi schemes with the collapse of FTX. There's going to be regulation that comes down. And I think the legitimate ones like Coinbase, who Brian Armstrong is, seems like a stand-up guy. He puts himself out there. He's on the forefront. Um, the legitimate exchanges and the legitimate coins that actually have utility and value, there will be an ecosystem for that. Yeah. Um, but that bubble, I think, is gone. People made their money and lost their money. And it's going to settle down into a few coins that will actually have value um, and kind of go from there. But no, I didn't buy metaverse real estate or <laughs> things <laughs> like that at all. Or stupid. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I know both of those guys. So like, I'm not hating. I'm just like, you know, it, there is, there was a lot of hype and we'll see. I think we're going to be in winter a little bit longer. And I think there's still going to be some great companies who come out of it. No questions. I've, I've still made some bets on, the sector, not necessarily on just, oh, one particular exchange, one particular token. No, I wouldn't say. Yeah, that. I, I agree. And I'm not a, I'm not an expertise at, by any means, just more mm -hmm. at, a, at a high level. I think to your point, it's the same. The sector, there's definitely going to be value in it. 
And it's finding those legitimate, I like the kind of B2B, like, or the, the yeah. infrastructure behind it that powers it, Absolutely. whether it's through AI, T5, whatever, the protocols, not as much individual random coins that someone took 10 minutes to prop up or an NFT that doesn't really have a utility or a value to it, right? No, That's more absolutely. just a social status. Great. No. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Iman, for being here. I mean, if anybody wants to connect with you, like, should I just send you deals or whatever? What's the best way? Yeah. So um, uh, just email me, kubian at gmail.com. Um, I have a website. It's crescentcapre.com as well if they want to see our portfolio or deals that we've invested in. I try to keep that up to date. Um, but email is, is, the, is really the uh, best way. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to like investing with you, you know, in the future. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. This is, this is, this was my first time doing something like this, but I uh, really uh, appreciate it. Well, get your name out there. No question. Yeah. Yeah, well, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And like, we will see everyone in the next episode. Thanks everyone. <laughs> thanks guys.